the scholarly communications librarian here at UCLA. That's a photo of me on the left pointing out the fact that we seem to have matched the day that I saw uh, the Picasso at the um, Ontario Gallery. So on the right, you'll see a number of different things that I work on here at UCLA Library. But we're only going to really touch on a couple today. The first being um, copyright and fair use. And then we'll also be looking at licensing for a little bit. So I do have a quick poll set up for you. So I'm going to go ahead and send that now. Two simple questions. Um, first, what brings you here today? Uh, you can answer, I love all things copyright. <laughs> My instructor here for the D&D. And then the second question is, how familiar are you with fair use? All right. So we'll go ahead and give everyone a chance who wants to respond to go ahead and respond to the poll. It's completely voluntary. It just helps me to know kind of who we have here in the room with us. Okay, we'll give it another 30 seconds for the poll. If you'd like to respond, please feel free to. So it's looking like half of you are here for all things copyright and just a little bit less than half are here for D&D. &D. So we'll get into all of those topics and I'll give you an idea of when we'll hit on those topics pretty soon. It looks like there's a few of you who are who wear fair use is new to you and a few that have heard it before. And then there's probably one or two copyright fair use experts in the room. So I'm going to go ahead and end our poll here. So you can all take a look at the results that we have. So thanks for all of the responses to that poll. And without further ado, we're going to launch into our content here. Okay. All right. So if you're here today, hopefully you're in the right place and where you want to be. And that's what the FU, Fair Use, Licenses, and D&D. &D. Now, first, as with many things that are law related, a quick disclaimer. I'm not an attorney and I cannot offer legal advice. And even if I was an attorney, I cannot and am not your attorney. So the following information here we're presenting today to educate about U.S. copyright law in general terms. If you're unclear about your options when it comes to a specific legal issue related to copyright, we encourage you to consult with an attorney who has a background in copyright law. All right. Now that the disclaimer has been delivered onto the content. So as promised, today's talk is going to involve some copyright there will be a little bit of data science, and then of course there'll be some D&D. &D. For questions, I'll pause at the end of each of these sections, and we'll also reserve some time at the end for questions. If you do have questions, please make sure to type those questions into the Q&A section. Uh, that should be available in your toolbar for Zoom. And if you do have any technical issues, you can let us know in the general chat. All right, thank you. So now we'll get started with some copyright and fair use. So for the purposes of this section, I will be generally sticking just to copyright, but I think it's important to place the context for copyright within this larger concept of intellectual property, and also to distinguish it from other types of IP, such as patents and trademarks, which we are not exploring today. So here, the U.S. Copyright Office says that creations of the mind um, form intellectual property. These are creative works or ideas that are embodied in a form that can be shared or can enable others to recreate, emulate, or manufacture them. You'll hear me talk about this again as tangible. Um, there are four ways that intellectual property is protected, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, and copyright. So again, we'll be only exploring the copyright aspect of things today, but all of these different forms of intellectual property do intersect with our daily lives on a regular basis. 
So what's copyright? Well, we're going to only be talking about copyright in the United States. And here in the U.S., copyright is a type of intellectual property that protects original works of authorship as soon as the author fixes the work in a tangible form of expression. So a type of intellectual property. We are all copyright users. And we are also all copyright owners. So everyone in this room here has used copyrighted material and everyone in this room has certainly either in their career as a student or as a librarian or in another creative capacity created materials that have been eligible for and received copyright protection. But there are some standards for receiving copyright protection. For the US, copyright protection actually is something that is very uh, much linked to our historical roots, and it is, in fact, the First Nation to have included a reference to copyright within its constitution, where it says, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Now, these works need to be original works of authorship in order to qualify for copyright protection. They must be in a fixed and tangible medium of expression. And there must be the result of some creative effort. So they cannot just be a list that is a list of facts, for instance. Um, right. And then another thing to note here with respect to copyright is we're really looking at copyright from a perspective of its jurisdiction of use, meaning the law that applies is the law where you're using the copyright, where your location is physically. So here for the context of our students, everything that we're talking about and all of the copyright law that applies is US copyright law. So what rights does a copyright owner get? Actually, they get a lot. It's a bundle of them. So under copyright, you have the right to make copies, the right to create derivative works like translations or adaptations, the right to distribute, which includes selling, renting, leasing, lending, the right to perform in public, such as a play or public performance, the right to publicly display a work. This can be a painting, it can be a sculpture, a manner of different things. And then finally, the right to digital audio transmission. It's also sometimes called right for broadcast. All of these rights collectively make up copyright. And the copyright owner may decide that he or she or it, if it's a company, wants to license the material uh, to other parties, to third parties. So when you see on older publications, things like all rights reserved, they're referring to these specific rights here. So how long does copyright protection last? Well, under the current law, because copyright law has changed a bit since the founding of the United States and the later adoption of the Constitution, works created on or after January 1st, 1978, enjoy a copyright status that's calculated as life of the author plus 70 years. So that's generally true for individually created works. There's a different standard for corporate works and also there's an exception for copyright protection when it comes to US government works. What if you're not a copyright owner? Well, copyright grants exclusive rights to the rights owner, but there are some exceptions and we're gonna really focus on one today. And among those exceptions are fair use, the first sale doctrine, and exceptions specifically for libraries and archives. There are also options of licensing or obtaining explicit written permission to use copyrighted material. All right, so some of you mentioned or indicated in the poll that you knew a little bit about fair use, but for others, you mentioned that it was new to you. Well, an important part of United States copyright law is the fair use doctrine because it permits the use of copyrighted content without need to seek permission of the copyright it. owner yeah. if, <laughs> if it meets certain criteria. So what is that? So what is fair use? Fair 
Fair use is a case-by-case -case test found in copyright law. When met, it allows a use of a copyright-protected work without permission. For example, using a quote from a book in an article may be a fair use. The fair use concept is central to copyright law and helps promote freedom of expression and innovation. Let's look at some basic concepts. There is no formula to ensure that using a particular amount of a work will qualify as fair use. Also, it's not as simple as declaring, I think my use is fair. While the law gives some examples of things that are traditionally fair use, not all uses that fall under these categories are actually fair uses. And some specific uses that do not fall under these categories have been found to be fair uses. Fair use is a case-by-case -case inquiry. We have to analyze each use of a work. Essentially, fair use asks us to think through our actions. Federal law sets out four fair use factors. The first evaluates the purpose and character of the use. An educational, non-commercial, or transformative use is more likely to be considered fair. A transformative use adds new purpose, meaning, or message not present in the original, as opposed to merely replacing the original work. A use that merely replaces the original use or purpose of the work is less likely to be considered fair. The second factor considers the nature of the copyrighted work and will favor fair use if the work is factual or previously published. Here, consider copyright's purpose to encourage creative expression by providing exclusive rights to authors. The third factor evaluates how much of the original work is used. In addition, pay attention to the importance of what was taken from the work. Are you using a lot of the original work or the heart of the work? Taking too much when not necessary is less likely to be fair use. The fourth factor analyzes whether the new use harms the existing or potential market for the original work. Fair use requires an analysis of all the facts and factors. The factors may point in different directions and may not lead to a clear result. It is important when thinking about fair use not to jump to conclusions. Only a judge can make an official determination of fair use. This usually happens during an infringement case. Sometimes it can be hard to rely on fair use, especially if there isn't a lot of case law available. Finally, if you don't know if a use is a fair use, you can always ask for permission from the copyright owner. If you decide to rely on fair use, be thoughtful and deliberate and keep these core points in mind. To learn more about how fair use is applied in different situations, visit the Copyright Office's Fair Use Index. All right, does everybody feel prepared with fair use now? So just in summary to go over that again, because there may be a reason to know this in a few minutes, uh, fair use doctrine is codified in the limitations on exclusive rights, fair use in the Copyright Act of 1976. It's in section 107. And it allows for the use of copyright protected works without seeking permission of the rights holder. Purpose and character of use is really important to consider. So examples of potentially fair uses would be things like parody, satire, political and scholarly commentary, reporting the news. Um, so something like a class paper would likely be an educational use and would also potentially qualify as more likely to be fair. In terms of nature of the original copyrighted work, there's a question about how creative or original was it? Was it just a list of facts or was there a lot of creativity involved? Third, the amount and substantiality of the portion taken really looks at your use of the new of the copyrighted work within your work. Did you take what you needed? Was your use excessive or was it 
necessary to use the amount that you used in order for you to make your point. And then finally, the fourth one is sometimes known as the market effect. And that really looks at the commercial impact that your use of that copyright protected material had on its marketability. Did you profit commercially? And did that commercial profit actually impact the market of the original? So these are all things to keep in mind. Now these four factors happen to emerge out of a court case of Folsom v. Marsh uh, in 1841. And really very little has changed since then. Judge Joseph Story's four-factor fair use test is in fact what we use today and what courts use today to determine whether or not a potential use or use case is fair. Right? Now, uh, show of hands, uh, yes or no. How many of you have heard about public domain? We sometimes hear from people, students, faculty, everyone really, that they found something online. So does that mean it's a public domain? It looks, yeah, okay, great. Looks like some of you have heard about public domain, but public domain has a very specific meaning when it comes to copyright. And in this context, public domain means something that is not or is no longer protected by copyright in the United States. This applies to works that were produced before 1927. There are some exceptions that apply due to changes in US copyright law that was brought on by us adopting the Berne Convention. But in most cases, this general rule of thumb would apply. Now, copyright protection has expired or was never eligible for those things that we consider to be in the public domain. And when I was mentioning different works earlier, one of the exceptions to works that have copyright protection is US government publications. So this one also has a little bit of an asterisk in that if you are a government contractor, you may potentially have negotiated a contract where you're allowed to retain copyright, but in most cases, most US government documents that are directly produced by the government do not have copyright protection. This means that these types of documents can be good ways or good sources rather for you to utilize in research and in remix and re reuse purposes. The other thing to keep note of is simply being able to find and access something online does not put this item in the public domain. When it comes to copyright, if you're looking for something in the public domain, it's gonna enable you to be able to use it for any purpose without restriction under copyright law. But again, it's because either the copyright protection has expired or the object was never eligible for protection in the first place. The public domain is the purest form of open and free reuse since no one owns or controls the copyrighted material in any way. Um, just a quick note here, if we're not sure about who owns a uh, work, but it was published after 1927 and presumed to still have copyright protection, just because we're unable to, at the moment, identify the uh, identity of the copyright owner, does not put that work into the public domain. Unfortunately, they get another name, which is a little bit sad, but it does describe the state that they're in, where they're called orphan works. So just keep that in mind, not being able to determine at the moment who a copyright owner is, does not place an object immediately into the public domain. In most cases, copyright protection would still apply. So are you all feeling comfortable with fair use yet? Because I think it's time for a little test. So you be the judge here. I'm sure that many of you have seen this poster. It's sometimes referred to as the Obama Hope poster. And this poster was created by Shepard Ferry in 2008. Uh, but there's also a challenge here. Um, should it be considered a work by Shepard Ferry or is it in fact either something that should be copyrighted to the Associated Press or does it violate or infringe upon the copyright of the Associated Press. So I'm going to ask you to determine whether or not you think this poster is a fair use or not a fair use. Let me give you a, some additional information. So you'll remember that the Copyright Office video stated that only a judge in a court of law can make that official determination. So let's play judge here. 
I would give you the facts and you'll be able to determine and make a vote as to whether or not you think the Hope poster is a fair use. It's a little bit complex in this case because when it comes to things like images, there can be multiple entities involved and it's not always immediately obvious who owns copyright. Why do I say that? Well, because here, the photograph that I'm showing you was photographed by freelance photographer Manny Garcia. However, the copyright for this image is owned by the Associated Press. The reason being that Garcia created this photograph as a work for hire. Now, what does that mean? Well, in copyright, works for hire are created by an employee as part of their regular duties or they occur when a certain type of work is created as a result of an express written agreement between the creator, in this case, that would be Manny Garcia, and a party specially ordering or commissioning it. In this case, that would be the Associated Press. So when a work is made for hire, the hiring or commissioning party is considered the author and therefore the copyright owner. So let's take a look here. Um, and we can actually see a progression. Um, I'll give you a little bit more information about what we're looking at. So Ferry began selling the Obama poster, the Obama Hope poster in 2008. And he based it on the design on the photo that was taken by Manny Garcia. However, it took until January of 2009 for the Associated Press to determine, in fact, that the photograph that was used by Shepard Ferry was the one that they had the copyright to. In the meantime, by July of 2008, there had been more than 200,000 vinyl hope stickers that had been created, 75% of which had been given away to support the Obama presidential campaign. The image became one of the most widely recognized symbols for the Obama campaign, spawning many iterations eventually appearing on different items of swag, and it was also commissioned in some cases by the Obama campaign for additional production. Ferry had reached out to the Obama campaign for permission to use a photo, but Ferry never contacted the Associated Press to license the image that he used. So in the slide that we're looking at here, you can see that there are a number, there are two photographs that were taken of Obama that appeared to be very similar. However, it was later determined that it was the top photograph, the Manny Garcia AP photo, that was the basis of the Hope poster. When the AP made this determination, they began to negotiate with Shepard Ferry for compensation. So what happened is a little bit interesting. Rather than going to court and waiting for um, Ferry waiting for himself to be sued, he actually sued the AP first and asked for a declaratory judgment from a judge to confirm that his use of the photograph was a fair use. So Ferry went to the judge and asked him to say, hey, my use is fair. Can you just give me that judgment so that I don't have to give the AP any royalties? Well, the AP showed the image that I show you here and they maintained that all of the same angles of Garcia's photograph were maintained, and the general coloration of the photo was also inspired by the composition that Garcia created. Therefore, they claimed that Ferry infringed on their copyright. So what do you think? Is the Hope poster a fair use? You should be able to select a yes or no option in Zoom. If not, Folks who think it's a fair use can just give me a thumbs up. Let's see what you all think. Seeing a couple saying that the use is fair. Anybody else want to chime in? Do you think that it's a fair use? All right. It looks like about half of us think that this was a fair use. And maybe the other half either are abstaining or think that it's not a fair use. Well, as I said, only a judge in the court of law can render a verdict on whether or not a use is officially fair. And so in this particular case, we don't quite get there, but we get very close. Because what actually happened is the judge in this case told the two parties to settle out of court because he felt 
that going further in trial would mean that the AP or the Associated Press would win the case. This means that the judge did not think that Shepard Ferry's use of the Manny Garcia photograph was a fair use. So while we have no official verdict on the question of fair use, the statement strongly suggests that this failed the four-factor test. So there's a little bit of information that came out after this settlement. And this sometimes happens with copyright suits and IP related suits. So this is just a little bit of trivia here, which is that in the following year, in February of 2012, Shepard Ferry actually ended up pleading guilty to destroying and fabricating evidence showing that he had used the AP photo. So in that period of time, it was revealed that yes, he had in fact used the Manny Garcia photo. It was not a fair use. And he was actually sentenced to two years of probation and 300 hours of community service, along with a fine of $25,000. And interestingly, uh, because this case did generate a lot of interest and attention, they went back to the original photographer and he was quoted as saying that he was so proud of the photograph and of the work that Ferry did artistically with it and the effect and impact that it had, but quote, he did not condone take people taking things just because they can off the internet. Take away from all of this is just because you find something online does not make the work a work in the public domain. So are there any other questions about copyright and fair use before we move on to the next section? All right, we'll be moving on to licenses. So we'll note here that I'm talking today about licenses in terms of explicit written permission. There is another part of copyright law where licenses refer to compulsory and statutory licenses. This only applies to recorded music, so we will not be talking about that context um, in terms of copyright and licenses. So for today, a copyright owner can give another party, a third party, or multiple third parties permission to use their copyrighted work. This permission is granted through what we call a license, and it gives explicit written permission, and usually in exchange for monetary payment. So the thing to note here that's in bolded is that written permission is necessary. Verbal agreements do not work for copyright. All copyright related licenses must be executed in writing. If you want to use someone else's copyrighted work, especially if there is that commercial purpose, remember that's related to that fourth factor in the fair factor, four factor fair use test, you'll usually need to obtain a license in order to exploit the work commercially. Okay, um, so there are things that licenses can do, generally speaking, they'll do the, what we have here listed at the top, which is that they will grant an individual who is not the copyright owner more rights than they would normally have under fair use. So they would be able to exploit one or more of that bundle of rights that we talked about earlier. But licenses can also sometimes restrict and grant fewer rights than an individual might have under fair use. This is not a typical use case, but there are examples that exist. And I'll show you one at the end as we talk about the Dungeons and Dragons situation. So there are two general categories of licenses. There are what we call exclusive licenses, uh, which only the licensee can use the work in the manner that's described in that license during the period of time in which it's valid. This means even the original copyright owner is not able to use that work in the manner that's described unless the licensee also grants permission for that individual to do so because they are the exclusive licensee of that particular manner of use. There's another type of license and that's what we would call a non-exclusive license. This means that you can give the same right to multiple entities, multiple individuals, multiple corporations if you want uh, to be able to use the copyrighted work in a specific manner that the license describes. Here, the copyright owner can also exercise those same rights during that period. There's no restrictions on them to do so. The one big thing to note here, and 
also a reason why it's important to maintain a relationship with the copyright owner, even if you are the licensee, is the fact that only a copyright owner can pursue infringement claims. So if you have a license and somebody is violating the license, you need to have the original copyright owner pursue that violation for, with you. So that's something to keep in mind. As we go on, now we're gonna talk a little bit about what we call public copyright licenses. Has anybody in this room heard of, pop, of public copyright licenses? If you have, you can raise your hand or send a thumbs up. This is a term that most people are not as familiar with, but tends to be something that there's some degree of interaction that we have with, especially if you're working in an academic context. So, all right, I can see there's a couple of you that have. Okay, great, thanks. So a public copyright license grants additional rights to the general public. So there's not going to be um, just a specific named licensee as it would be in a normal license. Rather, this license makes this work available in a particular way to all of the general public. There's no additional action that needs to be taken by the copyright owner to do this. They, in other words, they don't need to execute a separate license. And the public does not need to do anything in order to take advantage of the effects of the license either. Public licenses grant permissions for certain rights that would otherwise be normally considered most likely copyright infringement. So here are some examples of uh, some more popular models of public copyright licenses. There's the GNU GPL license. There's also the Creative Commons license. We're gonna take a look at both of those in a bit. By no means are they the only public copyright licenses, but there are um, quite a few, particularly with those who are involved in open source and freedom and free software movements. So you'll see these types of public copyright licenses being utilized. There's a subset of public copyright licenses that are what we call free and open licenses. And so these actually, in most cases, reserve almost no rights. And the only thing that they really typically ask for is attribution. Um, so in these cases, there's an acknowledgement that you make as the user of that copyrighted material and no other permissions are necessary for you to remix, reuse, the material um, as you see fit. So here I list two different Creative Commons licenses that would qualify as free and open. The first being CC by SA, SA standing for share alike, by standing for the attribution requirement. And then the second is CCO or CC0, which is a complete waiver by the individual of all of their natural copyrights to that creative work. Now, there is another license that is a CC public domain license, That that one really just declares that the item is already in the public domain. And so as you'll remember, as we talked about earlier, public domain is either expired or never eligible for copyright protection to begin with. So it's a little bit different from you affirmatively giving up any of your copyrights, which is what the CC01 does. It's a waiver license. So we'll take a look here on this next slide. You can see here's a GPL. And it's really important to note that there are some foundational tenets essentially for these licenses with GPL um, that they're specifically for use for software for any purpose. It does not matter if it's educational use or commercial use or personal use, you can use it under all of those conditions. There's a freedom to change the software as needed. So you can essentially hack that um, or jailbreak depending on what the circumstances of the item that you're using. There's freedom to share the software with your friends and neighbors. There's no, you bought it, you're the only one with a copy sort of restriction like that at all. And then there's the freedom to share any of the changes that you made as well. So this is an incredibly open license to make what we would call free software. Now, from an academic context, probably what you're more familiar with is 
the Creative Commons license. This is a license that does not waive copyright. There is sometimes that misconception here. Copyright protection does exist with items that are licensed with a CC license. It really depends on here the degree because what you're doing is you're publicly conferring a particular permission or right to the public without them having to contact you for permission. So we're skipping that permission step and making things more readily available for reuse here. So you can see here pictured is actually the license tool that helps individuals to select the level of openness that they want uh, for the license that they're going to confer on the creative work that they have permission to make a license for. So the important thing to know here is for CC, you must have, you must be the copyright owner in order for you to create a license for your copyrighted work. You cannot use a CC license on someone else's copyright work um, because you don't have the legal permissions to do so. Uh, the other thing that's really important to know about copyright and Creative Commons licenses is that Creative Commons is an irrevocable license. So once you make the determination of which license you want to use, that's it. That's the license that goes on to that particular version of that work in perpetuity. So really important things to keep note of. So if you're not sure which license you should use for a work that you want to give a Creative Commons license, but there may be some considerations that you'd like to walk through, this is definitely something that you can reach out to us at the library um, to help you with. So with that, are there any other questions uh, for licenses? either Creative Commons or otherwise in this section, uh, because we're about to move on uh, to Dungeons and Dragons. So any last questions for licenses? All right, okay. So we're moving on to what half of the room really wants to hear about. So thanks for bearing with me. Hopefully we have now the foundation to understand what's really been going on the past several months related to Dungeons and Dragons. So first, a little bit of background from for the folks in the room about D&D. So D&D or Dungeons and Dragons, sometimes with the letter N and sometimes with the ampersand. Um, it's easier when uh, talking about D&D to use the letter N, particularly when um, we're talking about technical things like having it appear in URL since the ampersand doesn't really work in that context. So this is going to come up a little bit later. Um, so. Dungeons and Dragons was a, and is a very popular tabletop role-playing game, or TTRPG. It was first published in 1974 by TSR. The copyright and intellectual property were then assumed by Wizards of the Coast, uh, which has been publishing and maintaining D&D since 1997. So D&D was designed by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, and it's currently in its fifth edition. But as you can see kind of from the image, hopefully on the right, that red box, um, it's now also been licensed and associated with some different other commercial IP. This is especially true since its incorporation of uh, Wizards of the Coast into Hasbro in the reorg that took place in 2021. So in this particular example here, I'm showing the D&D version that is affiliated or licensed with Netflix's Stranger Things. In fact, the relationship between these two properties is arguably really intertwined, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment, but a, more information about the evolution of D&D. So the popularity uh, in just three years after its release, 1977, it was so popular that it was decided that we should split D&D into two different versions, a basic D&D and then an advanced version, uh, or also sometimes called AD&D, for those who really, really love the rules. Now, for anybody who's played D&D, you'll know that there are a lot of rules. And in fact, that's kind of the core of the publication of the game is that there are these big rule books that explain the game mechanics and how it works. By a show of hands, are there any folks in this room who are fans or players of d and I'm seeing quite a few. Don't be afraid to self-indicate. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I'm sure there are a couple of DMs maybe in the room as well. Um, so 
here, basic Dungeons and Dragons, it's going to be really important that we understand the, that this split occurred because it will have something to do with the controversy that happens next. So the popularity of D&D, for th those of you who play and for those of you who don't, um, really spawned a lot in the world of gaming, especially in tabletop gaming, both in terms of encouraging free materials to be created and commercial. You'll see here at the right, uh, there's on YouTube, a couple of YouTubers creating resources for folks who want to make their own custom style and d maps, and also folks who are learning how to create 3D printed minis or custom miniatures. Um, and that information is made freely available by these creators on their respective social media and YouTube channels. But in the background, you'll also see a big array of dice. Um, and D&D in particular is very famous for that 20-sided die. And you can see there are a few in that photo there. On Etsy and other marketplaces, there are a lot of options these days for customizable D&D dice. Some of these have been the subject of very successful Kickstarter campaigns that have raised a lot of money to create custom paraphernalia just for D&D. All of this will become very important in just a moment. So now here's a bit of the data science. So here's a Google Trends analysis of the popularity of D&D &D tracking from the beginning of the service of Google Trends, which is 2004, to the present. We're looking specifically at the trends um, interest levels of D&D &D on the web. And you can see here in this particular chart that D&D &D appears to experience a gradual increase in popularity starting roughly around 2015. But for folks who were around earlier and also fans of Stranger Things, you'll note that D&D &D was extremely popular in the 1980s. So 2015, an increase in popularity in D&D. &D. By the following year in 2016, a lot of Hollywood was either secretly or openly playing D&D &D and hosting uh, sessions with many a A list and B list and C list celebrity. So here's an article about that very thing um, in the Hollywood Reporter that appeared in 2016. And then what about Stranger Things? Well, uh, set during the 1980s, the series really reflected the popularity of the CTRPG that was true to that period of time in which it was set. You can see here in this trend graph uh, from October, uh, from actually from July of 2016 to May of 2022, there are several spikes that I show you here with red arrows. They happen to correspond roughly to the periods of the season releases of Netflix Stranger Things show. So there's July 15th, that's that first leftmost arrow. There's a little spike there. Then October 2017, then again in July 2019, and then in the summer of July, I mean, summer of 2022. So you can see here, there appears to be some correlation where there's a little bit of a spike every time Stranger Things seems to drop another season. But in 2019, during the innocence of our pre pandemic days, DD was already getting extremely popular. It had been growing since 2015, 2016. By 2019, there were live action role playing groups that were playing DD sort of in person, in real life, in a way. And so there was a ever more popularity of the game, or so it seemed. But the period of COVID isolation actually did not hurt D&D. &D. In fact, popularity of D&D &D peaked around the summer of 2022, which is that first leftmost red arrow, uh, which was within a month or two of the dropping of the fourth season of Stranger Things. One could also argue that the popularity went up as well with the pandemic raging on. But uh, here we can see there was a very visible drop in popularity at the beginning of 2023. In fact, we can precisely date the crash in popularity and identify its cause, which was between January 5th and January 13th of 2023. So does anybody in the room know what I'm alluding to? I'm assuming some of you probably do. 
if you know what happened in January of this year that caused an impact on Dungeons and Dragons, please raise your hand. If not, I will show you <laughs> in just a moment. Yeah, something definitely happened and <laughs> the data certainly backs it up. So what actually happened? Well, <laughs> corporate greed is what happened according to this article. Um, Dungeons and Dragons fans faced, prepared to face their greatest adversary, corporate greed. And this is an article that appeared in the New Republic. But why? What actually happened? Well, what happened was Gizmodo leaked or received a leaked copy of a license. So we're coming full circle now. We're going back to licenses. And now we're going to talk about two very important licenses. There are two important license events that occurred in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. The first being the dropping of the original open gaming license in the year 2000. So this came out in, 20, in 2000, and it came out along with the D20 system manual. So this was all released together. The 900 word open gaming license was a quote, perpetual worldwide non-exclusive license. I don't know if you remember what I said earlier about Creative Commons licenses being perpetual and irrevocable. So they're kind of the similar idea here in that these things, once you put them out into the world, really you can't change them or so we think. Um, the OGL allowed independent publishers to use basic D&D. Remember I told you that split would be important. And they were able to take that D20 engine and incorporate that into a lot of other games. Because the OGL allowed uh, companies other than Wizards of the Coast to create new properties, this also meant that new games could just be created that did not belong to Wizards at all. This effectively made the D20 engine, if you will, the core of the tabletop RPG industry. It also helped to establish careers for thousands of writers and streamers as a result of this because many folks started to comment and create content around D&D. &D. The license also contributed to the growth of the universe of accessories for D&D, &D, like the materials that I showed you earlier as well as the development of gaming YouTube channels that focus largely around this D&D &D world. But all of that was shaken up on January 5th of 2023, when Gizmodo published in Linda Kadoga's article, Dungeons and Dragons, New License Tightens Its Grip on Competition, an exclusive look at Wizards of the Coast's new gaming license. Uh, it showed that in a 9,000 word long, 1.1 version of the OGL that there were going to be a lot of changes. Independent publishers were now being asked by wizards to register. So this is something that you would not normally have to do even if you were using the materials under fair use. But they were being told that whether you were large or small, if you were a creator of content related to D&D, &D, if you were an independent publisher, you needed to register with Wizards of the Coast and tell Wizards how much money you were making off of the D20 system or anything related to D&D. &D. Wizards also was asserting in this 1.1 version license, this right to siphon off a portion of their revenue of these third party creators. And finally, because of this type of language, it effectively revoked the original OGL. So they don't say in this 1.1 version license that this license OGL 2000, the 1.0 version is revoked. They just basically tell you that you can't use it anymore, period, no exceptions. So effectively, that's kind of the same thing. Now, and looking at a couple of the other differences that are significant between the two licenses is that in the original open game license, rules could be used in new tabletop RPGs without paying any sort of royalties. And in fact, we know that this happens. So games like Pathfinder, for instance, use that D20 engine, have nothing to do with Wizards of the Coast and have never paid royalties uh, to Wizards. It also, because of the fact that publishers were building this content around it. The D20 engine essentially became the dominant way that TTRPGs were, were basically being played out in real life. But the January 5th OGL leak 
uh, said, and this is a quote directly from the language of that 9,000 word license, only allows for creation of role-playing games and supplements in printed media and static electronic file formats. It does not allow for anything else, including, but not limited to, things like videos, virtual tabletops, or VTT campaigns, computer games, novels, apps, graphic novels, music, songs, dances. And if you wanted to do a panda vine in your LARPing session, sorry, but you can't do it. <laughs> so that's a pretty extensive list of restrictions. You may engage in these activities only to the extent allowed under the Wizards of the Coast fan content policy, which is a separate policy that is viewable online, or separately agreed between you and us. In other words, or if you don't follow the fan content license and you need something more, you need to execute a new license with us directly. Well, what happened next? Uh, I call it revolt. Um, here's an article from The Guardian. People are leaving the game. Dungeons and Dragons fans revolt against new restrictions. Wizards of the Coast, which owns the game, is preparing to change long-standing licensing rules. Again, the license that was originally in place, the OGL, the literal OG, is from 2000. So more than 20 years have passed with those particular licensing terms in place. And many would argue that the world of D&D has only grown and expanded as a result of that. What else happened as part of the revolt? Well, it's interesting. Uh, of course, social media was involved. Social media users urged other players to go ahead and cancel their paid for su subscriptions to Wizards online portal, D and D Beyond. So this was a portal that's the official digital tool set of the game. It's a companion for the D and D fifth edition, and it is owned by Wizards. So if you wanted additional functionality, you had a paid subscription, and a lot of serious D and D fans did. Secondly, there was also a major open letter that was created by a group of D20 developers that called Wizards of the, quote, of the Coast, quote, the dragon on top of the horde, willing to burn the thriving village, if only to get a few more gold pieces. And it characterized the version 1.1 OGL as an attempt to dismantle the entire RPG industry. So if you got from those words that people were furious, you are correct. And what happened next was not what Wizards or Hasbro wanted. In fact, so many people rushed to cancel their D&D Beyond subscriptions that a lot of things happened, like they crashed the server uh, for D&D Beyond. Uh, so you can see here what I call the exodus and the continued exodus so many fans cancel that it crashes the page following backlash and many, many gaming related online magazines and publications reported on this particular news. It was definitely the talk for the first two, three weeks of January of this year, at least. So this is relatively fresh, um, what we are seeing here in this particular talk. Well, I mentioned also there was that open letter with that colorful language about a fire-breathing dragon destroying a thriving village. Well, the cancellations, the irate folks, the folks who signed on to the open letter of which there were more than 77,000 players of D&D, all of that got Hasbro's attention and Wizards of the Coast chose to fully reverse course and revoke any of the 1.1 license. In fact, the current license that's still in play now is uh, still OGL. The other thing that also came out of this that's a positive and also refers to some of the other things that I've mentioned in this talk is that the entire 5.1 SRD is now available under a Creative Commons license. So the desire for players to have open access in some way to some of these different elements that were granted to them in that original license that they followed and that they insisted that the um, Wizards of the Coast follow uh, really did have an impact. So we're getting very close to the end here. I only have a couple of slides left, but what I wanted to reiterate here is that 
when we started at the beginning of this talk early in the slide, I told you that we were all copyright users and we were all also copyright owners. And I also want to leave with you the fact that I hope you will exercise your voice as a member of the creator community because when we're all owners and all users, this also inherently means that we're also part of the creative community and the creative commons. So because of this, you have a voice and as was demonstrated in this big revolt and exodus with respect to D&D &D against a massive corporation like Hasbro, the users won. And I think we rolled a 20. So if you have any questions, comments about that, I see there is a comment here in the chat. All right. And I'll leave us with here this last slide with content, which is we hope you'll exercise your right to fair use, support open public licenses. And we do have a guide for creators here. So that's the URL for our guide for creators. And there's also an email address if you have any questions related to copyright, if you want us to help you navigate a potential fair use license, please take advantage of those things and get in touch with us. So I did really prepare the talk to last just an hour. I know we have a little bit of extra time booked just in case folks might have questions, but I do want to thank you for all of the attention and participation that you gave today. Thanks so much. And we hope that you will join us for the rest of Fair Use Week um, if you're available tomorrow at noon. So I'm going to stop my screen sharing. If you'd like to ask any questions in the chat, we can definitely um, try to address those. But again, I want to thank you for you coming today and for your attention and interest in this topic. All right. And we can go ahead and stop the recording.